The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Napson. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And you might also hear our other friends, fans and air conditioning units. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it is sweltering in SoCal, and yeah, we're used to that. But this one's got a little extra dark side energy to it. It's it's uh, it's uh, something that we're all recording uh, in uh, studios that uh, we have to keep the sound down. So we apologize if you hear any noise in the background. That's just my perfectionist nature maybe taking over. Though I'm also lazy. It's a weird mix. Hi everybody, welcome to Star Wars Talking. <laughs> we're gonna, you I'm have specific mix. things you you uh, worry about, and I think some you must. Hey. We'll drill down sometime and understand what your fan trauma is, because you're always very apologetic about people hearing a fan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we need a bar conversation about all this, all that. But we're gonna have a lot of fun <laughs> today talking about uh, Star Wars news, breaking news from a long time ago, uh, interviews that contain stuff that we've been talking about for a few years, but it's a uh, uh, prominently uh, being discussed this week because uh, the five-year anniversary of Last Jedi is approaching. Oh, my gosh, time. We also are going to take a look a little bit more at uh, the Andor News and do an Andor News Roundup. Before we do all that, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. A little bit later, we have a force center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us but uh let's catch up before we all melt away uh jen star wars adventures in life how's it treating you it's quiet right now which is fine it's you know as we've talked about it's the quiet before and or begins (laughs) so i'm taking that time to clean the house and listen to podcasts as i do and i listened to i happen to find ewan mcgregor on the smart list podcast I don't know if you guys know this with uh, Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, hmm. and Sean Hayes. Hmm. And I thought, what, what is he going to talk about, right? And it is the most relaxed and comfortable I have heard Ewan McGregor <laughs> talk in a long time. You know, because we just had this whole press tour with him on Obi-Wan Kenobi. Right. He was very... I mean, he was very genuine and honest in all of his interviews, but, it, you know, they kind of say the same things over and over and over again. Well, this was like him just basically chatting with his peers. And he did talk about Star Wars and how when he initially auditioned for the prequels, he really wasn't sure about taking on the role because he saw himself as a very serious indie mm. actor, Danny <laughs> Boyle's actor. He felt a lot of pride mm. in that. And he didn't know if he wanted to do Star Wars because he felt like maybe it would typecast him. But as he kept getting callbacks, he's like, I, I really like this role. And who could, who wouldn't want to be, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi? <laughs> and then he just said that he really became determined to get the job. But it just was, it was just the way he talked about the whole thing was just really, um, really Mm -hmm. sweet um and sincere and just a look back on this legacy that he's helped to shape man it's crazy to think if he had been like no i'm 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 velvet goldmine guy no thanks (laughs) right exactly that's what he talked about yes 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 Mm -hmm. oh that's yeah that's really great i gotta listen to that he's when he gets going and gets in his comfort zone he is so like charming and likable and i feel like i feel like the thing with like the obi-wan kenobi press tour he just went on it's like every single thing he said is sincere but it was like well you all are gonna ask me the same five questions i'm Mm -hmm. sorry but here is the real answer (laughs) right Mm -hmm. and by the literal 800th time i've said it you know it is what it is yes yes so it was nice it was nice for him to have his guard down you could tell he was not having to worry about you know saying the wrong thing and Mm -hmm. the disney pr people getting upset he he it was just very relaxed that's awesome yeah it was a fun one that is a fun little Star Wars adventure. Uh, for me, pretty simple. I, I learned a lesson. We always talk about how Star Wars uh, could be applied to our life. Um, I, I had I had some time to myself this weekend. Grace was out of the out of the town, out of the house, and out of town shooting something, uh, which was a lot of fun for her. And uh, I held the, I held the fort, watched the Chihuahuas, and I had that like kind of like, well, all right, um, but what should I do to treat myself? I'm here alone, and I got the idea of pizza, and. <laughs> The light side, you know, I, I've switched to a mostly vegan diet, at least at home. And, and and I was like, no, we're doing we're doing it all. Meat, cheese, the whole thing. And I ordered so much pizza. I gave into my dark side energies. I gave into my <laughs> passions. I gave into my desires. Uh, quicker, easier, more seductive. The pizza guy uh, dropped off the food and said, you all have a good night. Despite just me <laughs> being there. 
<laughs> did the um, pizza person see the chihuahua? Was it a possibility <laughs> the chihuahua is being referenced? He did hear them, but there was so much pizza, including wings and salad and two large pizzas that he just assumed, what a party this guy's going to host. Um <laughs> It was just me, and I feel terrible. Oh, <laughs> I feel no. terrible, mind, body, and soul. So it was. I was like, you know, I had that little voice saying, "Just get one, just do one, and the salad, no wings." Nope. I uh, I gave in. I gave in. I, I I gave in to my desires, uh, my power. I wanted to rule <laughs> the galaxy as pizza and sun. So uh, <laughs> lesson learned. Lesson learned. I'm, I told Grace came home, and she said, "Yeah, I saw the pizza guy show up on the ring." Uh, Looked like a lot of food. I was like, yeah, it was too much. So uh, I'm going to follow the light side going forward. So, What do you want on your pizza? Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so there you go. Star Wars and pizza lessons learned. But uh, hey, Joseph, I know you had maybe some pizza this weekend, but a lot of fun as well. Now, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of fun. A great weekend. I, I also just want to say, Ken, I understand there have been some times where Sarah's been away for a literal week, and I'm just like, I'm going to eat a frozen pizza every <laughs> night. And by, like, the last frozen pizza, it's like I've hit rock bottom, and, like, <laughs> uh, I need some pamphlets and an intervention by the time I get yeah. to that last frozen pizza, and I have uh, I've stopped doing that as much. <laughs> so I understand. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, been a really great, uh, eventful, hot weekend. Um, Sarah and I, I've mentioned it a couple of times, are kind of in the process of uh, switching out a bunch of stuff from our storage unit and getting some new furniture and all that. So we've been going out and about in the town and getting lots of exercise. I moved my entire record collection into my apartment and we moved Ooh. like, you know, I don't know, uh, 8,000 pounds of vinyl. Uh, this wow. weekend, uh, 110 degree day, perfect. We, oh we picked out this weekend of like we're gonna make a big difference. Then we're both like, what have we done? Uh, <laughs> but we wanted to stay committed. Anyway, uh, point yeah. being, uh, yesterday we were out and about, went to Burbank because like, hey, why why not go to the valley when it's hot out and get it, like, <laughs> another 20 degrees of heat? Anyway, uh, I found a copy that I didn't want to get from the internet. I wanted to find. I found a uh, client, the client figure, the uh, Black Ooh. Series 6-inch Werner Herzog action figure. Wow. <laughs> Best Buy didn't give me a bag, which is fine. Mm. Great. Uh, but then we immediately went to a bunch of furniture stores, and I just walked around nice <laughs> furniture stores just carrying Werner Herzog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see the couch. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, I took a couple of pictures of him in I don't know what it was it Bob's or West Elm or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And then uh, just uh, <laughs> trying to be short about it, uh, we did go to the John Williams at 90 mm-hmm. uh, show at Hollywood Bowl. Uh, I was lucky to see John Williams back in 2018. That one was kind of a retrospective. This one was a little bit more just John Williams curated. Uh, mm-hmm. Night of Music. So the first act was a, a different uh, conductor playing some music by John Williams, but some music that John Williams is just like, this is great movie music and everyone should hear it. I didn't write it or anything, but everyone should hear oh. it. And the um, that was like the whole spirit of the thing. It was absolutely a celebration of John Williams. And it, it was kind of a celebration of his music, but just like him as a person, right? Like yeah. uh, how much people love him and just what a great guy he is. He, he came out and he said like, I'm 90 years old, but you've been this reception has been so warm. I'm going to live another 10 years and you all have to come to my hundredth no. birthday at the Hollywood bowl. He's like, I'm sorry for being silly. I'm just so euphoric. Like oh my uh, gosh. he was so incredibly charming. And then a lot of uh, the energy there was kind of like sharing the spotlight. So um, mm-hmm. one of the things he played was he, he told this little story of about how one of his uh, earlier jobs in Hollywood was uh, combining all a bunch of music from fiddler on the roof uh, from the stage show for the movie version and then writing little connecting pieces. Uh, mm-hmm. So some of it is by him, but a lot of it is, you know, by the, the composer of Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, but it, it the the piece uh, featured this just a jaw-dropping violin solo. And like, mm-hmm. it must have been by his request. The camera was not on him, barely at all, in mm-hmm. this in, for most of the concert. But uh, during this Fiddler on the Roof piece, it was just on this violinist. And it was kind of like amazing. All these people in, you know, Jedi robes and lightsabers <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there for this this other thing as well, this sort of bigger uh, piece of John Williams history and our whole cultural journey. And this uh, violinist finishes this just jaw dropping performance of Fiddler on the Roof and the place explodes and everybody's waving lightsabers at this concert violinist <laughs> for doing a banging version of Fiddler on the Roof. And it was just this sort of like weird and beautiful moment of of culture coming together of like yeah. i'm sure when you set out to be a concert violinist your main goal isn't to have a thousand people wave lightsabers at you but it was so clearly a celebration of what she had done 
you know, yeah. it, it was, it was just beautiful. Ah, that's wonderful. I, I've been fortunate enough to see him twice and it's always a weird, wonderful energy. And I think you've addressed it before, Joseph, you know, it's a lot of star Wars fans waiting for him to play Freebird, Right. And it's just like, <laughs> yep. let's do it. And, and uh, he'll make some choices. I remember one, one year I saw when he opened up with hook, there was a lot of like, Oh, hook or a lot of like hook. You got Yoda's <laughs> thing out there. Like, right. It's a weird energy. So I, I, that's actually great. I love hearing that, that everyone uh, gets the vibe and, and, and knows and respects uh, his interests and as well as his work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that uh, I'll wrap up here with this. So he, he they had the um, the program on the screen so everybody could relax that he was going to, you know, close the concert with uh, Star Wars, oh. which is great. Uh, and the main thing I wanted was the Obi-Wan theme. He did play the Obi-Wan theme. That was, you know, beautiful and soaring and, and amazing and and great to hear it live uh, in, in all those things. Uh, he played the um, the throne room into the entire end credits. It was like watching the credits of Ooh. A New Hope uh, live. Oh, Amazing. Wow. Uh, so, you know, he walks off and I had kind of guessed, like, I think he's going to do Indiana Jones as the encore because he mm. normally does Star Wars as the encore a lot of the times I've seen him. Uh, so he comes back out and he's like, uh, he's like, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but uh, I'm going to play something from the new Indiana Jones movie like six <gasps> Six months too early. It's uh, Phoebe Waller Bridges characters, uh, Helena's theme. Uh, oh James God. Mangold, the director, just kind of demanded that I do it. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he played that. He played the Indiana Jones theme. And he walked off, and everybody's you know screaming and on their feet, standing ovation. And it, I was like, I was like, all right, let's back up, let's go. And the ninety-year-old man came out for a second encore. Uh, like what? I was tired for him, and he uh, <laughs> second encore that I don't think anybody was expecting. And he closed like he often does with the the Imperial March and. It was like the Imperial March uh, as a Metallica concert. Like <laughs> it, there was just an energy, like all, all these people with lightsabers all around me were just like literally headbanging to yeah. the Imperial March. Yeah. And it was wow. just a, it was just a great uh, communal experience with fellow Star Wars fans. Uh, uh, so uh, in, in a, a four center fan uh, stopped and said hello. So that was wonderful as oh, well. So anyway, it was just a great, great uh, moving Star Wars experience. Wow. Uh, Love it. Love to hear it. And yeah, I saw some of the social media posts of uh, him debuting uh, Helena's theme, and I knew you were there. And I was like, ah, oh, good, Joseph. Was to hear that one. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he did it the second or third night. I, I wasn't following it there. But uh, yeah, if you all get a chance, uh, man, I, 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 I'm, I'm ho I'll be there for the hundredth too. And I, I'll, uh, <laughs> all energy that happens, but it's a quite experience. And that's yeah. awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. So that was my adventure. That That's is exciting. A great Star Wars adventure. Absolutely is. Uh, let's uh, go on to our news adventure this week. Five years out, Ryan Johnson looks back at The Last Jedi as a headline. He did this with Empire Magazine. Ryan Johnson gave a big in interview with Empire Magazine, which is, that's just kind of, it's weird to read that and talk Star Wars and go, <laughs> I don't, why would he do that with the Empire? Uh, but he was, of course, promoting uh, Glass Onion, which uh, de debuts at a film fest soon, I think. Um, a lot to digest in the interview. A lot of things have uh, been on the Star Wars discourse desk for all five of these long years. So I, we wanted to hyper focus on some of the bigger points and things we want to talk about here. Ryan talked about the movie and specifically the story of Luke Skywalker within it being an affirmation of the myth of Star Wars to do so. He kind of intended to, when sitting down to write, to peel back the layers of Star Wars itself and confirm its lessons and its impact. This is not far from our thoughts, to be clear. That's not just a pat on the, our back. It's just kind of how we like to engage with Star Wars. We dig into what is there. So it makes sense that a lot of times we hear some things that have been discussed around these, these parts. And, and it's kind of, you know, uh, again, why we're here. But he had some good stuff about, um, about that here. But I wanted to, Jennifer and Joseph, talk about what is the value in that for us as fans, this movie in particular, peeling things back uh, in 2017, 40 years after the <laughs> franchise arrived. And uh, what do you think about that uh, glass onion of a layer peel? Yeah, I was really surprised by how much he shared. Um, speaking of somebody, you know, who's speaking so honestly, although he was very careful in a portion of the interview about choosing his words wisely mm. when it came to <clears throat> Mark Hamill, who, you know, has expressed some disagreements mm. uh, with, with the character. But what I loved is that Ryan said that he approached his film as a Star Wars fan. And, you know, because as he said, Luke isn't just a myth in Star Wars. He's also a myth amongst generations of Star Wars fans. I just thought that that was really, really smart. Um, and it's what made the movie for me really fresh because we all had these expectations of what we thought Luke Skywalker would, would do. 
right? Mm -hmm. If he knew that the mm -hmm. galaxy needed him. But yeah. is that truthful to where we find this character for him to be this, you know, hero springing into action in the swashbuckling adventure, grabbing that lightsaber from Ray? Is that truthful? And Ryan Johnson said, no, this is what's truthful. And in doing that, in choosing the more difficult choice, in my opinion, yeah. Yeah. Um, the story in The Last Jedi becomes more of a modern myth. Mm. <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me, because it teaches us something about our humanity. And that's why George Lucas made Star Wars in the first place, right? You know, he wanted to tell old myths in new ways. And Ryan Johnson did that. And a lot of people didn't like it. <laughs> 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 but the, I found it to be, that's why I love The Last Jedi, is mm -hmm. because it it is it is teaching us something about ourselves. And sometimes that can be hard to confront. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those cracked, dirty mirrors reflecting ourselves sometimes. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just what's here. Uh, and, and I think you're right. It, it was the more difficult choice. Uh, uh, I, I could have grabbed that lightsaber and run down the hill, right? And, right. and it would have been a lot of joy. And I, my, myself included. I'm not going to deny that. It would have been, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of what ifs out there that I do enjoy and do enjoy thinking about. But we love to engage with what is there, Joseph. And like I said, uh, this is something that's been on our minds and something that I know you have spoken wonderfully and eloquently about, about what the movie does. And so uh, five years out, is it, uh, you know, what, what is the value? <laughs> What's the value? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's the the double layer of value. There's the mm -hmm. what is the value of uh, Ryan Johnson, the writer director, talking about it now, and, and and like Jennifer said eloquently, what what is the value of the actual storytelling uh, that yeah. gets to live on through generations uh, that's actually in the film? I think the value for me of Ryan Johnson talking about it is, for me, it is great to hear confirmation from the creator of a thing that uh, that I've talked about, other people have talked about, but it is it's it's become really important to me when talking about and thinking about the Last Jedi. This idea that it challenges lots of core ideas of Star Wars in order to validate them. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The same way stories challenge main, they introduce you to a main character in the first act and you see the character's strengths and you see their flaws. And in the second act, they often fall to some of their flaws. And then it is their, the, their connection to their strengths that lift them back up and they're validated by the end. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that kind of familiar path is done not just to the characters, but to the ideas of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Luke's in particular, um, but also with Poe's when to fight and when not to fight. Uh, Finn's question of when, uh, it, uh, is it worth fighting at all or are both sides the same? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think having having the director clarify that, that that's mm -hmm. his intent and belief, I think does have some value. I don't always want um, writers and directors to explain everything, right? Um, yeah. But I, I think it's been an, a fascinating journey with The Last Jedi because they're the people who really dislike it, who have glommed on to the, oh, it, it's a subversion and mm -hmm. only focus on the, on the parts of it that are challenging uh, Star Wars and not what happens at the end of the film. But mm -hmm. there's been an interesting phenomenon for me, uh, just speaking personally from, from people I've interacted with in real life, people who love the movie have, set, have kind of talked to me with the same talking points as the people who hate the movie. Mm. Uh, yes. that it's all about subversion it's all about kill the past it's all about see this is why the jedi are bad always will be <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's why right. luke wants him to die the last jedi is so great and i and for me it, it has been a like watch that watch that third act <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch that triumphant moment where all of the um the big lessons that that jennifer was speaking about so well are there when when luke does you know take up uh, the saver. And, and I think for me, that's uh, to answer the, the question of um, why does it matter? Why, why did, why did it, the ideas need to be challenged? I think for me, Last Jedi do, has a bunch of moments that take ideas that were absolutely in Star Wars and then sort of crystallizes them. Mm. Um, I think in particular with, with Luke, you know, going back to things that Yoda said uh, of, you know, action and adventure, you, you know, a Jedi craves not, adventure excitement, a Jedi craves not these things, right? Uh, calm at peace of passive what is the point of a jedi you go to like some of those uh, great uh interviews with uh, or, or videos of lucas explaining star wars to the clone wars writing team right, yeah. <laughs> right. and he's talking about how the dark side is always going to try to grab for more and so the light side is there to just hold it back mm. that image of luke reconnecting to i've lost my own understanding of what a jedi is and why they matter ah calm peace stand up when you absolutely have to to hold the darkness back 
And The Last Jedi is just a literal image of that, uh, mm-hmm. of him doing what a Jedi truly, truly deeply needs to do and in a way that works for him, in a way that's passive and in a way that uh, celebrates uh, life and, and defending life. So I think it just, it, it takes these core ideas and really validates them in an inspiring way. No, well said as, as, as usual, but uh, don't ever want to undervalue what you say here, sir. It's, it's really important about, uh, <laughs> about it. You know, it's not a, hey, it was, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And there's the part of this value going into the sequel uh, trilogy era, you know, there's without a doubt, um, it, without a doubt, it is uh, the, um, it's an IP, right? Disney acquires this company. We're going to make more of these. And, you know, JJ and Lawrence Kasdan and team come along and say, all right, we got the previous generation hanging over this story and let's address that. And literally a broken starship in the desert. And we got those kind of imageries. And I, I love that Ryan's kind of is like, yeah, all right. So this is, this is this big company, this big job. Uh, and, and we're bringing back this thing we all love. Let's ask uh, ourselves why. And, 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 maybe dive into that. And I think that's a little bit of what is going on here and a little bit of why this will stand the test of time. Uh, there is this weird phenomenon. Even some people who I know love this film, who are people I myself love and respect do what you talked about, Joseph, where they, where they, where they say, Hey, Oh my God. Yeah. Last Jedi taught us, you know, kill the past, you know, no, no nostalgia. I'm like, hey, it, 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 it. I don't know. Uh, dig deeper than that. Dig deeper and go into it. So anyways, um, I, I, I also think, uh, Jen, I don't know what your thoughts are on this too. It, it's, it's something I know, Joseph, you, you've talked about. And, and I sometimes, I almost come down in the middle of like, I do love hearing creators go, here, here's what I did. But maybe because this is like the music side of me, the, the, the radio side where I'm like, sometimes I just don't want to hear what David Bowie meant in that song. <laughs> mm. And David Bowie doesn't want, you know, rest in peace, doesn't want you to know what he meant in that song. And there's great value in that. And I find myself, um, when the same talking points by creators get put out there or, you know, a company makes them sit down and say, all right, point at the screen and tell us what's on there. Um, yeah. It's not as uh, you know, I have different feelings about it, but uh, it, you know, this movie in particular is <laughs> sometimes I think you do need to go, Hey, here's what's this. Here's what it's about. <laughs> it's right. just, I don't know. It's a weird, it's about Jed. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I like seeing how the sausage gets made and and I know that not all creators or actors or producers, directors, they don't like, always like to talk about it, but I like it. (laughs) I either want to be validated in what I think it's about, or I want to learn and understand Mm. because sometimes maybe, maybe it's why I'm not getting it. And I'm like, Oh, this is what you're trying to say. Okay, now that gives me a new appreciation for this material that maybe I was not into. So I find it to be really helpful because we all are going to approach any type of art through our own specific lens and our own points of views. And so, but at the end of the day, I want to know what the artist is trying to express. I find I I get frustrated when they're like, well, you can think whatever you want. I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> maybe it's like the, 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 I don't know, OCD perfectionism in me where I'm like, I just want to know the answer. And I, and I want to <laughs> I give me, give me the, give me the key, you know, give yeah. me the key so I can decode things. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I love that he, like I said, that he shared so much and that he really, and now it's been enough time. If this mm-hmm. had happened you know, a few years ago, I would have been like, oh, okay, here we go again. I was gonna stay. Yeah, but yeah. I, I appreciate now that it's been, and he's promoting something else. And so, and he's yeah. been able to be very successful with this new quote unquote franchise. So mm-hmm. I like it. It makes me, it makes me happy. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. Sorry, sorry, Joseph, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. I was just going to say, like, I think I've had that experience in a very, uh, in a much smaller way with like some of my plays. I had a conversation once after a fringe festival with somebody of like, well, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I know what I intended, but you know, uh, what did you think? And the person was like, gave this really weird and <laughs> really weird, upsetting interpretation. I was like, well, it's not that. <laughs> so I think there's a, uh, there is that like it, some things are, I think creators intend to be open-ended. And then I think mm-hmm. there's times where like, Ooh, people are running with this the wrong way. And that's maybe a legitimate discussion of like, is, is that, you know, a valid criticism of the film if a lot of people are picking up the wrong message, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think what's powerful about this, if I can just read uh, part of his, one of his quotes, right? Uh, he says, the final images of the movie to me are not deconstructing the myth of Luke Skywalker. They're building it and they're him embracing it. Mm-hmm. They're him absolutely defying the notion of throw away the past embracing what actually matters about his myth and what's going to inspire the next generation. So for me, the process of stripping away is always in the interest of getting to something essential that really matters. 
So um, I think the reason that I'm not bothered with him talking about this is I feel like that message to me is is clear in the film if you spend some time with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that he's literally calling out the kind of key line that does distract yeah. some people and saying, yeah, hey, feel free to interpret it. It's not what Kylo said in the middle, though. <laughs> the fact that he's kind of coming into it to say, to specifically address the fact that some people have focused on this part of the film and him not necessarily saying you're wrong, but saying as a creator, that wasn't my point. Yeah. No, I love it. And, and, and to be clear too, going even just this discussion on, on hearing them, like you know, I'm someone who, if I have a extra half hour of my day, I'm going to, you know, whip open that Star Wars archives book and just read George explain something I've grown up with. I do love it. I'm with you, Jen too. And there's something, um, I don't know, Joseph, if you agree at all, where it's like where we are in this modern era, sometimes I just want John Kasdan to be quiet. <laughs> and sometimes I just want all the clickbait headlines to go away and they mm -hmm. fuel each other. <laughs> and mm -hmm. right. and yeah. I, I don't mean to pick out on John Kasdan because I actually enjoy him and, and looking forward to Willow. But like, you know what I mean? It's just like that's where some of the energy is, too. Of just like, just go, just go let the song play, man. I, yeah, yeah I, I think the thing that I, I said is with some exceptions, uh, you know, I'd be fine for like a culturally agreed upon, no laws or anything, but like a culturally agreed upon like two years, like you get yeah. excited because like two years after your favorite movie came out, then mm. directors and writers just talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that, mm. that bothers me is when you know, a lot of people and people I really enjoy and their work I really enjoy, like Kasdan, like mm -hmm. John Kasdan, like uh, Chris Terrio, like Ryan Johnson himself right after Last Jedi coming out kind of like the weekend of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and it, it it feels less like creators reflecting to the 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 stories and interpretations that have grown up around a work, and more like uh, almost like damage control or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I I, th I just think let it breathe, and then yes, please, yeah. I want to know what what writers and directors think, but let it breathe, let let us live with it as a culture for a little while first is where i come down ultimately you have my vote in the next election sir <laughs> <laughs> i agree with it. no it's a it's a weird mix it, it, it's something we've, we've discussed both yeah. on and off air around here and it's and it's uh because i might have even even in this interview seeing this interview kind of make the rounds this past week i was like i just don't want to relive this <laughs> <laughs> trauma, yeah. trauma from, from 2018 discussions but speaking about that we got a little more discuss in this uh large uh interview i think you can get it free on the app it's so weird now you go click on a link and Nope, you got to get a subscription. And I'm all for newspapers and magazines needing to make some money. I'm I'm here, but it's sometimes I don't know where to read these articles anymore. I sound mm -hmm. like an old man screaming at the cloud with an onion tied to my belt. Brian <laughs> talked about the movie's reaction and living with so much of the scorn being felt by him and others on social media. Uh, he seems to have learned a lot going through that process and is in a different place with it. Talking about in the early days of one negative tweet and I would try to correct that person's view or figure out what was wrong with me and them. Uh, so what, we, what have we learned about navigating and understand, understanding being online as Star Wars fans and pundits and podcasters since 2017, late 2017 into 2018? Uh, Jen, it's, it's been a challenge at times, but uh, hearing his words, what do they mean to you here and what's your own experience? Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about last week, The Force Awakens and how The, the Force Awakens woke me up because it made mm -hmm. me realize how vocal and quite frankly racist a section of, of mm -hmm. the fan base can be. That was very surprising to me. I had never really seen it online. And what happened was when The Last Jedi came around, it was like that group had become more mobilized. And they mm. began, it kind of corresponded with the all right movement. I hate to say this, that, that kind of came about because yeah. Trump's presidency began in 2017. I mean, all these things kind of aligned and it just became the last Jedi became this thing that just ignited mm. that part of the fan base. Now, what's interesting is like back then that, that group of fans, they said, oh, you know, they don't like politics in star Wars. They didn't like that. Their hero, Luke Skywalker was, was not the alpha hero that they expected him to be. But I think that that's kind of changed over the years. And now what I saw with like Moses Ingram and the Obi-Wan Kenobi show is that these people are not just like trolls that are trying to stir up trouble. Uh, they're people that we might know. They're people that we come across in our everyday lives that just don't, that believe diversity and inclusion is a threat and somehow anti-American. Mm -hmm. And that's like, 
and obviously, like, if you don't like The Last Jedi, I'm not saying that you're a part of that group because I have friends who who uh, we've debated about why they don't like The Last Jedi, and that's totally understandable. Um, but it is interesting to see how things have changed kind of since The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can also look at the, the DC stuff, and it's all been happening. And I, I think that it's starting to to change for the better because now companies like Lucasfilm are speaking out against it. Mm. But it was very, it was a bad, and I know a lot of people actually left social media, Mm -hmm. not just the actors, when The Last Jedi came because it became too much. It Mm -hmm. became like this thing I love, like I'm scared to even share my joy online because I'm going to get pounced on. And I remember I would like share one little thing about The Last Jedi and it was like a swarm of these accounts would just like pounce on me and it was it made me actually want to stop talking about it because i'm like i don't Mm want to deal with that today you know Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. uh, i just i and i cannot imagine being you know kelly marie tran or or Mm -hmm. ryan johnson and having to deal with that and like what do you do do you like you do do you combat it do you hide what what do you do i don't know Mm -hmm. oh it's just really yeah it's a tough time yeah, it's a lot. It's 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 a lot. And going back to that, no, and I I, I look. I'll just, you're not wrong connecting it to these um, bigger uh, issues in our country and in in the world. It's it's absolutely con- connected, and that's one of the things I I learned from the early 2018 days of going on, you know, Collider Jedi Council saying, oh, yeah, I love this movie here," and having people, you know, it, it was different than people on the set debating me. It was it was different online, right? It was right, and and, and some again, yeah. And there's always this. Uh, we need we feel we have to qualify. It, uh, n- not everyone, not everyone. It's like yeah, we know it's not everyone. It, it, we we just know what was happening. Now I think you look back and you see it really start to crystallize around this time, mm-hmm. uh, and how susceptible people are to some of these organizations uh, or some of these folks with certain beliefs on their channel, and how just other people who are, I think are normally great good sometimes even progressive people who just take this. Yeah. You know, I didn't like Luke Skywalker. You're right. Oh, this channel, I agree with this channel and the not connecting that channel with what they really mean. Um, mm. Some of the, the, the racist stuff, the sexist stuff, all that kind of stuff. And it, it really just kind of, it changed me. It, it pulled back, uh, made me pull back. And I, and I love what Ryan has said from the beginning of like, Hey, look, there's some positive things there. And I, I think I've been forced to pull back far enough to make sure I try to see only the positive things. Again, not the constructive criticisms and all those kind of things. We can debate these movies at the end of, end of times, but pull them back and going, all right, let's 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 weed through the the darkness and find what is truly there. We have a great force center community. We have a great force center uh, mm-hmm. listenership uh, and, and, and connections. And I've made friends with this, stuff, and it's still there. And I see that in Ryan five years out of him, just kind of going, yeah, I, I learned it. And I think also knowing where a lot of it was coming from. Uh, is is why we can now make some changes, including Amazon. You're seeing there's some stuff I'm uh, not privy to, like I'm on the inside, but I have a friend who's working with some uh, a company that's helping Amazon, and th- they're just in their own way trying to put a foot down on some of the stuff. You hear the review bombing and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. hmm. and it is being dealt with differently than it was around the Last Jedi. Not just yeah. the Disney Lucas film, but just the industry. They're they're not just going. And we talked about it with Boyega last week. It's not just. Ah, uh, that dude doesn't like the Last Jedi. It's like, oh, that dude doesn't last je- like Last Jedi because a a black man and an Asian woman kissed on screen, right? Mm, like, mm-hmm. That's right. what we got about it. So you, a lot we've learned a lot, and and Joseph, I'll, I'll let you come come in on this one here too. I just you know <laughs> trying to find the positivity. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. But uh, if if uh, you know if it's there, we got to go towards the light. Yeah. No. I mean, I think that's what it's about. Is is going toward the light it's really difficult but like this is the power that that jennifer was talking about so well about the power of of luke and the last jedi like you know trying to be luke (laughs) you know uh stand up uh for the light that's what a jedi is and finding a way to not have all of social media or have all of star wars discussion ruined Mm -hmm. uh by the negativity right And, Mm -hmm. and i think those distinctions are important i think it's great that ryan johnson makes it his specific quote uh is as the element that i talk about when i talk about a small fraction that gets amplified is not the section of star wars fans that didn't like the movie it's the section of them that are abusive online and that are actively hostile and toxic right Um, right then you know so i think uh uh there's you know, the the important distinction that there are people who dislike the movie and they can be negative about it. And then there are people like, they aren't even Star Wars fans. This is an opportunity mm. uh, to inject more uh, racism, sexism, xenophobia mm. into, uh, you know, the discussion sphere and, and amplify how 
large that voice appears to be, right? right. Um, and, and he had another great quote in a different article in in uh, uh, discussion with Cinema Blend, uh, mm-hmm. where he mm-hmm. talked a little bit about how to handle it. And he said, "There's a lot of great genuine interaction that goes on, meaning on social media." The bad stuff, the systematic trolling, the almost gamified abuse that some people devote their entire online presence to, honestly, once you've seen enough of it, you see the pattern of it. It just sort Mm -hmm. of gets boring after a while. Uh, (laughs) You know, it maybe has an amount of, you know, uh, that that sounds like a great coping mechanism. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I think for me, it's, it's just a, the, the two-pronged thing. It's the recognizing what is like with um, going on with uh, the Rings of Power, right? Where mm-hmm. that's, it, it has diversity, so it is being systematically attacked, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And recognizing that is almost like, that's like an imperial incursion on a planet, and it has to be fought, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Y- you have to stand up and say no. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's just the, even if people are not... Uh, uh, don't have a specific agenda of xenophobia, right? There's just the choice to be more negative when we talk about it, you know? Yes. And that's the thing that I think we also need to just like learn from Star Wars, you know? Um, going back to Yoda talking to Luke about the force of is the dark side more powerful, quicker, easier, more seductive? It, you know, that's just true on social media, even, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're just sharing your opinion to try to share it in a, in a gentler way, I think, you know, helps us all in the big picture. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is you know to spin this off into a two-hour deep discussion. <laughs> on this. But no, there's something that's. Um, I think uh, the the three of us have, have uh, we've never sat and let, let's have a force center meeting and determine how we talk about things. I think we're just naturally aligned and uh, go towards light, protect the light, while also dealing with what's there and things we don't like. And just how I always say this, even off air to friends who have the, I've had this discussion with we choose how we discuss it. We choose the words, we choose the energy, we choose the tone. Part of the reason that's valuable and why I have distanced myself from some of the people in this space who I would say aren't the phobia and ism laden people, at least on the surface, at least they don't think they are, but it's the way they choose to discuss it and gives into that. Not, Hey, not all fans uh, are that way, but I can still hate the last Jedi. Yeah, you can, and you can hate it. You can hate it if you want, if that's how you want to lead, lead (laughs) with, with that kind of energy. But how you discuss it, it's like cleaning up our own house, mm-hmm. right? It, it's some of the stuff I've battled in my own life uh, with either, you know, certain political leanings in, in, in my past or my family or my old job and some of the folks in there where it's just like, I understand you're the good one. You've got to help us fight the bad ones then and not just point and go, those are the bad ones that ain't me. And yeah. I think that filters into how now, five years later, why it's important, uh, the way you discuss it, the way you present your criticisms. Uh, it's not just simply about not, you know, concentrating on joy or not wanting to take joy away from fans who like it. That's part of it. But just like, yeah, you, you, you leave room. Don't leave room for people to glom on to the, to the wrong things. And, and, and you are accidentally uh, maybe at times or in unintentionally supporting the darker um, things out there. If that makes any sense, Jen, I don't know, but yes. you know, I- Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, when I I shared my thoughts about um, Reva and and Moses Ingram's character, and it was interesting to see the difference in approaches. Some people were like, yeah, you know, her character didn't really resonate with me. I really wanted her to do this, this and this, or I was hoping for that. We had thoughtful discussions. I had some some people that were just like, she's terrible. She's a terrible actress. I'm like, Mm. Oh, that that gives me nothing. Okay, well, mm-hmm. why? Why do you think she's terrible? What what makes you what what do you qualify as a good actor? Right? Mm-hmm. I just think that like it when you just give up. I hate this. I hate that. It's like what my what my kids do. You know, I don't want. I hate. I hate the beach. What? Why? Why do you hate the beach? Because there's sand. Okay, you know, like you drill down. You drill down into what what the real thing is that you're trying to say. And if you don't, and it it takes courage, right? To like Mm -hmm. really put your thoughts out there and to say, I don't like this because X, Y, and Z. It's a lot easier for somebody to say, I just don't like it. Deal with it. You suck. Like it's just like it stays at this surface level discussion Mm -hmm. that I'm just like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even engage with you because if you're not willing to put in the time to your argument, why am I going to come back with my argument, with my evidence and present my case? Right. (laughs) And I just kind of feel like we're now at this point in social media where things have changed way back when we first started. Yeah. We all kind of shared opinions. Like I had a delicious lunch today. Okay. (laughs) You know, here's a picture of my yummy salad. Like we're, we're past that. We're now, our words really matter. They will come back to haunt us. 
Yeah. They are, you know, people use it uh, in jobs. They'll say, hey, I saw what you tweeted about this. Or um, so it's just all really important that <laughs> if you're going to share an opinion online, share it. Don't don't yeah. hide behind the. the yeah, just being like, I think that there is this this thing of just like, yeah, e even if you have no isms, right? Uh, right. Uh, you're not being racist or sexist or xenophobic. Are you just a a, a bringer? of negativity right mm -hmm. i mean imagining somebody like you're a great engineer but i see you spend all of your days just randomly replying to people who eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that they're crap like right you know, why do you need to do that like and right. that that's some of the stuff that i'm aware of too of just like it, uh, sometimes i don't post something joyful about rise of skywalker on facebook mm -hmm. because i don't want drive-by negativity mm -hmm. it, and that's not about me disrespecting somebody's opinion it's about them bringing negativity to my joy for no reason like it's mm -hmm. great that you don't like it post yeah. on your own page yeah. yeah why are you coming to my page to you know uh put some uh negativity into my joy yeah mm -hmm. yeah right. no. uh, by the way my first instagram photo was of lasagna i believe <laughs> <laughs> so, and one of my final thoughts on this and, and uh i wish i had the tweet up but uh, our pal Andres Cabrera from uh, uh, the, the the first cut uh, film folks over there, and he, he works with me in Castle Talk, and, and it's been a force center many times, and, and hopefully will be again. He he just what, during the Moses Ingram Riva stuff during during Star Wars Celebration, I, he just put out a tweet of, I, I'm paraphrasing, but but I, I I don't care what you think about her acting or the writing. Look around, now's not the time. Oh yeah, mm. I remember that. That was so mm. good. And yes. that's kind yes. of what the energy I'm talking about, too. And I think, what, yes. you know, Joseph is a drive by negativity, and everything where it is not someone angry in a car going, here it is. I'm going to use all the keywords to get the YouTube algorithm going. I'm going to repeat the same phrases over and over. I'm going to put them all caps in the description and I'm going to gamify the system and make a lot of money. It's not those people. It's just the, the person with a normal podcast or a person at the bar. It was like, yeah, you know, you're right. The Moses Ingram did suck. It's like, all right, even if you feel that, and even if that's true, look around. This black mm -hmm. woman's being attacked simply for being a, a black woman in this cast. Now ain't the time, bud. Take right. a seat. And I think that's part <laughs> of what's going on here, too. And that's mm -hmm. something that I, I, we, I think I really, truly myself learned um, late 2017 into 2018, where I dared to say, I like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so... Anyways, any final thoughts on that one? We have uh, one more thing for this interview. This was a big interview. Uh, yeah, my just final thought is to try to bring it back to positivity. I, it, yeah. it is great to uh, hear from people who listen to this podcast and many other podcasts that choose to uh, stay positive in terms of the way we discuss things, even if we don't like something being kind and decent about it. It's clear that, you know, there is power to the light side because that's what people always say to us is thanks for your Star Wars talk and for the kind of uh, friendly attitude about it. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that it is important to keep uh, a fight in the good fight. Mm hmm. There you go. Absolutely. And, and and for the final record, not every four center listener loves every opinion we have. No. <laughs> uh, in the discord server, there is some like, oh, I took a different or that. It happens a lot. I don't want anybody to think this is just a big old bubble heading in the same direction. There's there's thought. There's discourse. There's mm -hmm. discussion. It's, it's uh, how you, our listeners, all choose to discuss it with us. It uh, makes it all good. Final thing here. Uh, Ryan stated that he was rem uh, this, it, remain close with Kathleen Kennedy. All right? So uh, that's what he says. And they talk often about him being back in the Star Wars world. He still contends, like her and others have in the past, that schedule remains the biggest hurdle. Ryan said, it would break my heart if I were finished. All these years later, Joseph, Jennifer, what do we think when we hear the phrase, Ryan Johnson trilogy? Jen? Yeah. I think the idea of a Star Wars tril trilogy in general kind of feels far-fetched at this point, unless we know it's going to be a guaranteed success. Mm -hmm. or like there's kind of already a fan base for it. So not that there's not a fan base for Star yeah. Wars, but you know what I mean? Like, like for example, the old Republic yeah. or the high Republic, even I just think the movie industry has changed dramatically is why they've shifted to Disney plus and streaming services and things like that. Um, it's just different. So I, be I believe Ryan, when he says that, you know, he's going to work for Star Wars and that he's friendly with Kathleen Kennedy. And I think that they believe in him and they enjoyed working with him. Mm -hmm. But I, I go back to I think Kathleen Kennedy once said this about something. She was like, it's always about finding finding the right time. And yeah. I, I think maybe five years from now or 10 mm -hmm. years from now, maybe we'll get a Ryan Johnson Star Wars movie, but not anytime soon. Yeah, I, I agree with that. 
I agree that I'd rather, I, or not rather, I think it's more realistic to think of, uh, you know, he's going to direct uh, Mando season four's premiere, something like that, you know? Right. Uh, yes. I think it's more realistic. And I'd love, uh, you know, when I hear that phrase, I, there's a little bit of like, uh, I don't worry about it anymore, right? Because <laughs> I, I would love to see it. I was a big, uh, big fan of that idea when it was announced and, and still. So would I love to see it? Absolutely. I just think uh, for yeah, uh, many reasons, um, many reasons uh, that uh, I don't think, uh, I'm expecting anytime soon. So I'll take that five to 10 year bet, Jen. That, that's okay. a good spot. <laughs> yeah. Your thoughts when you're in a coffee shop and you hear Ryan Johnson trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think perhaps the, the uh, word trilogy might uh, distract us. Cause I agree with Jennifer. Mm-hmm. I think it is a very wrought time to, to just announce like ahead of time. Yep. We're doing three movies, no matter what. Right. Um, that that's a real budget question that's a real you know question of everything that that is uh, being uh, changing in hollywood with the box office almost month to month seriously Um, yeah and with the streaming services almost month to month um so uh, uh, i think ryan johnson will do some major star wars project uh, again uh Mm -hmm. i think uh for him to say i've stayed close to kathleen and we get together often and talk about it Mm. Uh, in Hollywood, that is a massive sign of uh, commitment if you physically get together with an executive at this point. Yes. yes. <laughs> Maybe he means over Zoom. But if he's <laughs> physically had three lunches with Kathleen Kennedy in the last five years, he's set. Uh, that's that's my uh, opinion about it. Um, I, I also just think that, yeah, this this absolutely lines with everything that they've been saying of, you know, Kathleen Kennedy is, is obviously, and the whole team is still exactly figuring out what, what do the movies look like. Uh, and I think that the... the um, streaming service side of it is how, do people want big movies do they want entire franchises of big event films that live only on streaming right now ryan johnson is a pioneer of that his deal mm-hmm. for uh, the knives mm-hmm. out trilogy uh, or to do two more films that are mostly going to exist on netflix but netflix mm-hmm. can change its mind any moment yeah, um right. he is also kind of at the vanguard of do we want to do these kinds of movies on streaming so i'm sure that's part of what they're talking about not just creative of Mm. well do you want to do you know one movie in a theater or do you want to do it this epic trilogy that's only on streaming is that make sense Mm -hmm. that is so i didn't even think about that of course he could do a a movie only on streaming oh my that's probably Mm -hmm. how we're gonna get it that's how we're gonna get a movie from him that's why they're having all those lunches (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, we got to we got to do some scooping. Uh, you know, yeah. if they have lunch in person, uh, you know, it, we always go to Smokehouse mentally and, and literally here. Around <laughs> but, uh, you know, Disney's more on the Glendale side of things. So we got I got to find mm. some Glendale, re- like Damon's, the Damon's Hawaiian Steakhouse <laughs> brand. That I used to, I, we're going to find them. We're going to find them having a lunch in a corner. We're going to do this. Let's stake it out. That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just, uh, Cheesecake Factory, uh, Red Robin at the Gallery. Actually, that's closed now, sadly. All right. Oh, uh, there you go. Oh. There you go. Ken knows all the chain restaurants' fates in this town. He does. He does. All right. We're going to take a quick break, talk about an, uh, and an avalanche of Andor news. A lot to get to. But on the, before we do that, we're going to do a Four Center Recommends. Joseph, uh, what do we have today? We are still recommending the great Star Wars book, The Princess in the Scoundrel by Beth Revis. We did a uh, big a breakdown of it. Uh, Ken and I uh, got some kind words uh, from the author, uh, Beth Revis, who listened to the podcast. And I feel like when we do a two-hour podcast and the author just says, I listened to all of it, <laughs> <laughs> I feel great pride. Truly, truly love this book, so I encourage people to check it out. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, uh, we appreciate those kind words from uh, Beth Revis. And say, yeah, I listened to all of it, and I got uh, like teary eyed or misty eyed. I'm like, yeah, wait, did we say yeah. something wrong? Oh no, no, I think she meant <laughs> it in a positive way. So uh, check it out yourself, uh, and then uh, yourselves. And if you uh, want to go back and listen to our deep dive on it, The Princess and the Scoundrel, download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com/forcecenter. Again, that's audibletrial.com/forcecenter for your free audiobook. All right, quick break on the other side, and or news here on Force. Welcome back to Force Center, the big show, the superstar destroyer of our fleet, the bright tree village of our hearts. Which, by the way, Jen, you just at least <laughs> at least read the first hundred pages of that book. Oh where yes, it just quality Ewok time. It's got oh. Landa written all over it. It's all right? amazing. God, the, the Leia uh, drawing that they yes. shared. Oh my gosh, of her and her wedding dress. I freaked mm. out. Yeah. I- <laughs> 
Yeah. I had to pull over because I was like, what? <laughs> what is this? Wait, wait a minute. Are, you, are you getting Star Wars news while you're driving? <laughs> oh, I was stuck. I was stuck in, you know, tra- terrible yeah. traffic. And I yeah. glanced down and I was oh, like, I oh, okay, hold on. I've done that too. Yeah, it would be a long video. But honestly, I think instead of doing like a trailer reaction, you should do a first hundred pages reaction and film yourself while you're actively reading The Princess and the Scoundrel because <laughs> you're going to be doing so much screaming. And then the flower flyers came in and you <laughs> <laughs> made a ring. Oh my oh, god! Oh my gosh! I'm gonna freak out. Okay. Yeah, Chirpa, Chirpa got drunk at the reception. Uh, what? <laughs> um, that's in, that's in my head, Ken. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some more Star Wars news. Like I said, it's an Andor news roundup, as uh, you know would be expected. Uh, the series, as original plan, would have already been out by now, but it comes out September 21st, and I still feel. Some of the marketing that was in place for the 31st release was still in place. <laughs> they just like, well, we got, we got to we, we, train left the station here. Uh, mm-hmm. So here's where we go. We've got four things. We're going to run quickly through what's there. And then we're going to kind of go into like one thought or two about each. Uh, we had the, what I'm calling the everything TV spot, little uh, 30 second uh, spot that I think the highlight is uh, still in Scar's guard as Luthen Rail yelling at Saw Gerrera, everything, which was amazing. We had a timeline video where Diego Luna uh, just simply came and said, all right, cool. Hey, here's where the story takes place. <laughs> we had a n- new poster. And then we had Genevieve O'Reilly in an interview talking more about Mon Mothma and what we're going to get. I think there's some fascinating things. Some of it we've already heard, uh, you know, married life, uh, personal life, politics, how it all kind of intersects. But she uh, talked about how she still, from the time be, uh, she was cast in Revenge of the Sith up through Rogue One and now Andor, she still goes back and reviews, kind of watches Caroline uh, Blankenson's Mon Mothma performance in Return of the Jedi, which I found interesting. So... Uh, we'll start with the everything TV spot. What's one thing we liked about the TV spot, Joseph? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I liked the uh, the ha, the the sound effect in the music. It made me feel like Boba Fett was singing this. Uh, <laughs> yes. It, I loved the music, but it had a little bit of that same uh, quality as the uh, Boba Fett theme of starting with wah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that mm-hmm. was one thing I was very curious about. Uh, yeah. a, a small thing I liked is that um, seeing the TIE fighters, right? I knew they were going to mm-hmm. be there, but the scream and the bolts, it got me excited for Yep, there's a lot new about Andor, but it's going to be exciting to see old things in a new context. Mm. So I was really excited by the TIE Fighters. And the big thing was just the Luthan intensity, right? I knew it was a Luthan, yeah. uh, a focused one. But a, a couple of real specific things. Uh, a lot of times the dialogue, you can't really tell what scene it's attached to or who's talking to who. This one mm. line, it, he's clearly actually saying it to Mon Mothma, right? And he's saying, mm. the time has come to force our hand. Or I'm sorry, the time has come to force our hand. Um <laughs> And, and then combining that with um, the the scene where Saw's like, well, you know, what does it cost? And this is everything. Um, that is, the, both of those are combining to make it seem like, okay, yeah. in, in this era, Luthen's the zealous one. Luthen's mm-hmm. the one who's saying anything. Luthen's one pushing Mothma and Guerrera. Uh, that it makes him a an very interesting character. And I know that this show is going to be deep enough that we're going to get the why of that. So I'm mm-hmm. just really excited for Luthen. Oh, it's so great. Love that. Love that. Yeah, the music. Uh, time Grappler. Got to see some Time Grappler again. Yeah. I'm always mm-hmm. excited for that. Chad, no, uh, one or two things or whatever whatever you want to say about this uh, wonderful little trail, trailer. I was shocked because I got a push notification from YouTube and I thought... It- uh, could it be? Yes, it is. Another another clip, another uh, TV yeah. spot or whatever. Um, at this point, I just want to watch the show. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm, just, yeah. I'm getting full off the appetizers. Just give me the meal now. <laughs> so, um, I really like that. Usually, we see Saw Gerrera is the one yelling with a sense of urgency, and this time, like you said, Joseph, it's Luthen. Everything, uh, very intense. <laughs> Saw Gerrera actually looks very calm <laughs> yeah, yeah. in comparison. Um, so I'm excited to see this character and and to learn more about him and uh, his different costume changes and outfits because um, he has many, and yeah. I like that. It seems like he goes undercover. Uh, but that, that's what the, the, yeah, I mean, isn't it, wait, did you title it everything? I, I, I don't know if it was that. I just, that's what stood out to me. So. Uh, oh yeah. Me too. Yeah. Okay. That was, yeah. that was my favorite part. Everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah. The thing I've been loving so far, even I, we talked about that minute or so clip they uh, released with Andor and Luthen. And I was talking about this with a, a friend a couple of days ago where, you know, I'm, I'm clearly hyped up for the series. I'm like, you, Jen and, and Joseph, like, just, just serve the food all right i've looked at the menu 
Give me the food. I've been um, ready to rock for 25 <laughs> minutes. Uh, are you ready? What are you going to do with your life? Watch Andor. Just release it, please. Um, but uh, lo- yes, and there's TIE fighters and there's action and there's blasters and, and uh, Bix is run and there's, there's action in this series. We know we're going to get it. The things I've been pulled in by so far are those conversations, are the mm-hmm. tense Where'd you steal that from? Uh, I'll pay you credits for it. Or this one of just like, what's it? Everything. It's got to cost everything. And it's no one's, you know, no lightsabers are out. No TIE fighters screaming in these these scenes that I love. And all that other stuff. I don't know about the lightsabers, but all the other stuff's going to come without a doubt. It's a Star Wars story. But uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for these really intense, low, almost whispered, we've got to do this conversations. I think I'm excited <laughs> about that. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then we got the timeline video. Uh, this is uh, this was this was just wonderful. This was like a corporate synergy video of yes. uh, you know, like some good infographics. A lot of stuff going on here. This is uh, like Joseph, you and I loved uh, watching the guy from Denny's talk about Denny's Diner and Solo. Right? <laughs> just had that energy a little bit better. Uh, anything you uh, uh, anything you guys reacted to uh, to this little uh, what I call direct? Hey, this is when the show is marketing. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, my main reaction was, uh, let's travel back in time and do this for every project, right? Yeah, uh, I think it's just a great, it, 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 I think it was um, written and delivered, of course, by Diego Luna with enough sort of uh, pomp and circumstance uh, and uh, mm-hmm. energy that it didn't come off as just a, a, a Denny's marketing plan, <laughs> uh, even though it's got that energy. But it, 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 the value of it is the clarity, you know? Um, yes. Would this have helped Solo a little bit? I'm not saying a a one timeline video would have changed the box office fate of Solo, (laughs) but it might have helped a little bit. It it might have. Rogue One did fine at the box office, but probably more people would have enjoyed it, you know, if, you know, they didn't think, hey, is that Ray? (laughs) Yeah. You know, I just, I just think I love uh, Star Wars kind of exploding out in every direction timeline wise. And I think as much as we can help as many people just get simple clarity. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the clarity of when it is on the timeline does also tell you, well, why should I care? You know, mm. the, that line of thrust into, you know, a, one person th- finds himself thrust into a journey that sparks the birth of rebellion and sets in motion everything you've come to know, right? Mm-hmm. That's hyping, that's telling a casual fan, why should you care? Like, oh, did that Andor guy help build the rebellion? Yeah. Oh. Uh, also, I'm very curious if that's a bit of hyperbole or if the Andor show is going to try to be like, no, this is the birth of the rebellion. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, good selling point for casuals, a uh, uh, great way for us uh, intense fans to debate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> what about all these other events that spark the birth of the rebellion? Yeah. So right. interesting. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying here too, about hey, you know, it's just an example of maybe they've learned over the years and how to, you know, help, uh, help prep the casual fan, which we, we can't overlook. We don't, we try not to overlook, but mm-hmm. these things become, I say this a lot in the game of Thrones world, the, the, casual general fans are the ones that made it a phenomena not the mm-hmm. book readers not the ones who know every inch of the map it's the ones who are like cool dragons are fighting let me watch that's how the numbers get big and we want star wars to succeed so it's going to be the where is this what are we doing now oh it just makes a lot of sense maybe something they've uh, learned over the years i, I would think uh, so uh, jen uh, did you learn a lot were you like oh i didn't know <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It reminded me of like when you're going on a ride in Disneyland and they would have that video playing so we could see Diego Luna before we're about to go on this Andor ride. <laughs> Patrick Warburton on the California Soren thing. Right. Yeah. But I, I honestly, I do think it's actually really helpful. Yeah. The graphic, it, for me as a visual learner, I was like, oh, this, this is great. Of course, I know when it takes place, but I'll tell you what, I have a little timeline chart a Star Wars timeline chart by my computer that I refer to often. Wow. Be- because I just, I get, it can be overwhelming, right? It is, can yeah. Can you share uh, that? I have a lot of stuff going on and I'm like, wait, when is this thing was? Okay, all right. So Diego Luna, and I even love, there was one point where the graphic like goes, the, the line goes right into him. <laughs> just to make it extra clear that this is, this is now his part of the story. Yeah. I loved it. Loved it. It was it was a great TikTok video. Uh, they they were home. Oh, I want I want to know more about Landa's timeline map because I think we I might buy one. I'll, how much <laughs> are you selling them for? I think sometimes I need them. I even I look. I even had the, uh, some of the uh, like recent books and and Brotherhood and everything where I just kind of like like I don't even want to know that like what week is it? Mm. <laughs> like we're because even Beth Revis said about 
Princess of the Scoundrel, she's like, I knew I had about 21 days to tell this story oh in the Star gosh. Wars canon timeline. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I w- Alex Damon, if you're listening, get us the canon by day video that's 19 <laughs> hours long because I think that's going to be valuable. Uh, that, is, uh, that is great. We also had this new poster. I got to tell you, it's a great, I love this poster. And what makes it for me, because, you know, there's a, the modern movie and TV poster sometimes gets, uh, I don't malign. I think sometimes for good reasons where there's a, you know, like this one here, you got the main star, then all the other characters flow out, right? It's a very similar design. We've been seeing this kind of, kind of design for the last few years. Uh, and sometimes I think it is generic and they don't stand out. This one stands out to me. I know what you guys think. It, it is the TIE fighters screaming in the background, the starter store, and that smoke. That smoke is the big difference for me. I don't know why, Joseph. Mm. You've got a little, some mm. skills here designing things. <laughs> what is it about the smoke that makes a old Kenny go, yay? Yeah, no, I, I gotta, I gotta pull it back up so I can uh, yeah. do my my best uh, work when when it comes to uh, composition discussion. <laughs> um, yeah. So in the meantime, uh, I, while I'm while I'm pulling it up, I think that um, one of the things that's great about it is I, I do like some posters that are a little bit more just. Um, simpler and iconic and mm-hmm. i think like the kenobi posters did that uh yeah. and then we do have the posters that are a little bit more busy because they have all of the heads uh, the thing that is powerful to me about uh th- this one is uh in-, in fact there's a slightly different version of it that's a billboard that went up on uh the walk between our home and the hollywood bowl mm-hmm. um and sarah and i passed it and i went ander and she, she's like and she's like, what are you okay it's like oh it's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole thing with Luthen. it's like ander uh but then i was i like i was like i wanted i asked sarah i was like hey can i point some things out to this billboard and she's like sure that's great and it's like here here are two things one the second biggest head is mon mothma which yeah. is great because mm-hmm. that we're going to spend quality time getting to know this human being uh, this character mm-hmm. um it, but then all of the heads are like and all those other heads we don't know most of them yet and we're going right. to get to know these new characters mm-hmm. and i think that's the power of having this many faces on this poster um mm-hmm. and then compositionally uh i think it, it is the power of diego luna's eyeline uh, the way the smoke is billowing upwards, it's like there's an explosion right about his hip behind him. Uh, the energy of the smoke going up throws your eye into that corner, and then Andor looking powerfully back the other way pulls your eye back into the poster. Mm. Yeah. See, that's why I go to this Kinko, sir. All right? <laughs> you know. By the way, Joseph studied it. He did just work. Kinko, so I am teasing him. No, no, that is no, you're absolutely right. The eyes, his eyes are the center of the poster in a lot of ways, even though they're mm-hmm. in the right corner, it's everything about it. It's everything about it. No. And you're right. Yeah. The, the poster of floating heads is like, as you can call it is sometimes, uh, is, is like I said, generic, this one, you're right. I mean, looking at it now, it's like sure. Mothma and we're getting to know Luthan all, already with his uh, gravelly voice. We love and saw everything else. I might be able to tell you the names. I don't know them yet. And mm-hmm. it is kind of a, uh, collect them all type of vibe. You're going to know all these characters soon. That's exciting. Jen, yeah. Your thoughts. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. I thought, I don't really know these characters, but by the end of this series, they will be old friends. Mm. Um, I love, for me, it's about Cassian looks consistent to the Cassian that we met in Rogue One. Mm. I like that, even though this is going to be a a new story, a new journey, new origins. Uh, I also love the diversity. Ah, Mm. there are so many women on this poster it's incredible so many different types of people old young sorry uh stella scars card refer you as old you're not old <laughs> older older i get a senior discount <laughs> and or uh younger it's just it's great it makes me just it makes my heart sing i i just i'm so excited for this mm. show just give me the show let the rebellion begin already please <laughs> it is always here uh, joseph do you have anything i think i cut you off anything else to add about the, the smoke billowing yeah. up no, you, you didn't cut me off, but I will take the opportunity to say um, I, I love how much the internet loves Hoodie Luthen, and I'm glad Hoodie <laughs> Luthen is on the poster. And I look forward to buying that action figure variation, which is specifically Luthen with Hoodie. Well, the, the amount of uh, variations we've seen in his looks, I think not since Padme, will we have the need for a figure collection that has all the looks of Luthen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh final gosh. thing in here we talked about is Genevieve O'Reilly just so excited to see more of Mon Mothman and her in this role and it's just a it's a fun little note of you get a little part in 2005 or for a movie released in 2005 you're cut out of it spend you know uh, showing up on YouTube videos spend your career going I was in that but I wasn't technically in it and then next thing you know you are in it 
Uh, you're in, you're in Rogue One. You're in Star Wars Rebels, and now you get to be a serious regular here. It's just kind of kind of a fun kind of thing to see. But how do we feel about this thing that she uh, she still watches uh, the the original Mothma uh, in Return of the Jedi and pulls a lot from it there, uh, Jen? Uh, you know, Return of the Jedi it means a lot to us. What do you think about this? Yes. I love what Genevieve O'Reilly has done with the Mon Mothma character. She's really given her life and just, um, and I, I, here's the thing about Carolyn, uh, Carolyn's performance Mm -hmm. for me, if ever since I was a kid, it felt very stiff, very Mm -hmm. regal, very, Mm -hmm. um, it it was, it was specific. Right. But I didn't, I didn't really know much. She just kind of seemed like an enigma, the character of Mothma. And and she still has kind of remained somewhat of an enigma, which is why I'm excited about her storyline in Andor. But I really think that Genevieve O'Reilly picked up on this thing that I never really realized, that the character seems worried, mm-hmm. fearful. You know, she's got a lot. She's got a lot on her plate. And the fact that she took that and kind of ran with it and made it uh very real is what I'm going to say. Uh, her her performance, her acting is very real and rooted in truth, and I, and I really like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though there's something like you know, as a as a kid, you're not analyzing this. You're just on the playground, and you know, mm-hmm. it's just this. Uh, you know, I, and I always say I kind of grew up thinking Leia was the leader of the rebels, and that was it, right? It was just kind of right. how it was kind of positioned in a lot of ways. Uh, and again, she was the only, you know, action figure you had from, you know, you didn't even have a Jan Dodonna action figure, Kenner, come on. So I just kind of, it was weird for me in Return of the Jedi to be like, well, who are they? Who are the, who are these people? But I was drawn to them, definitely drawn to Akbar. I had a, I had a Maydeen because that beard and hair, but, but Mothma was angelic in a way, but I, I did always pick up on the sadness. And it was this kind of, uh, the, the sadness, somber, um, mm-hmm. serious nature of it. Of, of as a kid of just like I think I did pick up I connected with the idea that these are the good guys going to go win as as a, you know I'd already learned that's what happens in movies but man she wasn't cheering you know there was just some weight to it and I think that always worked and so to pull that um, and build a character and kind of explain how she either gets to that point or why she has that thought and why she also has tries to have a normal life this the mention of her home life and what we're going to see with that conversation mm-hmm. happened there it all it all's just making me more excited to build back to that to know that she still uh brings that up and to kind of go all right here, here let me let me connect back to this performance joseph i don't know it it's always uh that means a lot to me as a original trilogy kid yeah it means a lot to me too i mean i i love that we're gonna finally get to know more about mothma i love what she says in that interview about you know uh we see her talking to senators then we meet her at home with her husband pub we see the public and pli- private we see her literally and figuratively take off her cloak and reveal herself as a woman in a way we've never seen before thrilling mm-hmm. great mm-hmm. but i love that all of that starts with uh the performance in return of the jedi because i think it, you know we talk about the tip of the iceberg storytelling of of star wars that i think one of the powers of the original trilogy in specific is yeah it mentions the clone wars and you go with what, what is that but it's also just in the performances where you, you just see a little note and you know that there's so much more to that. And mm-hmm. I feel like, yes, Mon Mothma comes across as uh, regal and uh, I'm just getting things done. But also there is this sort of like great uh, authority to her, mm-hmm. but it's quiet and it's heavy yeah. and it's serious. And the Mothma line, right, is the many Bothans died to bring us this information. And right. that to me is like the tip of the iceberg line of like, in the middle of this briefing to talk about plans, there's this somber, like, we don't have time for a, for a full funeral, but I'm going to deliver the weight of a funeral in one line to rem- remind us all, th- it, this rebellion is a horrible thing that has to be done, but it's being done at great cost. And let's not let the Bothan sacrifice be in vain with this information. And there's like all of those ideas in that one line delivery that could have just been flat and thrown out with everything else. But the way she stops and is clearly haunted by it and is clearly making this leadership choice to let everyone in that room see that she is haunted by Mm. the fact that the Bothans died for this, uh, that is just kind of emotional tip of the iceberg storytelling. And here we are decades later 
in this other great performer, Genevieve O'Reilly, is gonna gonna show us the rest of the iceberg. Yeah. <laughs> oh right. man, you make me excited to, to kind of quote Pee Wee Herman. I'll say I'm gonna go watch Return of the Jedi right now. Like I <laughs> really, I I think I'm just gonna put that on today because uh, yeah, you, you you're uh, you take me back to a place there, and you, everything you're saying is right. And just yeah, and it's it's one of those like famous Star Wars lines and how after Rogue One and we could get one about the Bothans. Yeah, great, oh great, guys. great, great joke, great joke. So proud of yourself, but there. It, it does mean a lot, and it does mean, mean a lot in that moment, and as the Star Wars story continues to roll out, you're going to be able to look back on that. Maybe we'll, we will get more of the story one day. Are they a species? Are they a gang, a group, whatever it was? There, there it seems like to be up in the air in the canon, but yeah, a lot there. Uh, uh, we always say this about uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Sir Alec Guinness, right? He, he created enough space in, in, in his performance that you could just put an entire lifetime of stories in the middle of those lines, and, and I think she does that too. So mm-hmm. thank you, Caroline uh, Blankenstein. All right, that is our look at Andor news, Star Wars news, Andor news. It's all the same. Before we get out of here, though, we're going to take a look at Star Wars history. This week in Star Wars history, looking ahead to Star Wars past. And, ooh, this is, I thought of Jen specifically for this one, but uh, <laughs> September 7th, 1985. Uh, school just back in session, maybe a week or two, wherever you were in the schools uh, in your neighborhood. Star Wars fans were treated to something extraordinary. The debut of the Ewoks and Droids Adventure Hour. Two shows, one hour of greatness. The shows are part of ABC's Saturday morning cartoon block. Over the decades, both shows have been loved, mocked, forgotten, and perhaps secretly enjoyed by all. And definitely, I think, recently uh, rediscovered. They got a new life with the re-release of the shows on Disney+. Plus. Friends, let's go back to 1985. What do those shows mean or not mean back then? And how did that reflect our fandoms then? And we can talk about what we think about them now. Joseph? Yeah, this is a, a real consternation to love journey. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, back in in, in 85, just to kind of uh, uh, put a picture to it, to the way I experienced it, uh, is that, you know, genre uh, on screen, superheroes, spaceships existed in like a couple movies every mm-hmm. other year, or the only other place you could get it is Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. So the thrill that we were going to get some more genres uh, on Saturday morning, you know, in between Mr. T <laughs> cartoons, yeah. you know, was so thrilling. And I was so hungry for more Star Wars. It was a dream come true, but a bittersweet one. Because, of course, as a kid, I wanted lightsabers and spaceships and blaster battles. And this was focusing on the, the cuter and the funnier side. And, you know, even as a, a kid, you know, I, I liked the Ewoks. I got the action figures, but I was a little like wired teddy bears in, in my action adventure thing. Um, so when I was a kid, I, I was, it was bittersweet torture because I wanted more Star Wars, but it wasn't exactly the Star Wars that I wanted. Hmm. Now, um, now as, a, as an adult, I appreciate the absolute importance of the, the funnier and, and cuter side of Star Wars and watching the cartoons back. There's a bunch of weird, scary stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> Much more weird, scary interesting thematically deep stuff going on in these fun kids cartoons than I, than I picked up on uh, as a kid. So, so old me is, is shaking his finger at, uh, at young me. Mm-hmm. And they're also more fascinating now because they're they're Now they're a cultural document of that yeah. time, you know, that bonkers droids theme uh, <laughs> from, from 85. Uh, but also like things like, yay, that's an early version of Dex's diner in an episode of droids right, you know right, right. They're, so they're fascinating just as you know cultural documents there's a character named kaibo ben or kaibo ren right mm. um they're fascinating on multiple multiple levels so challenged back in the day love them now <laughs> mm. love this jenna i, I want to end with you here so i'll slide in yeah. uh, a little bit here for a second it, it, yeah I, you're saying a lot of things i identify uh, with and connect with joseph just like it's the time uh, we are two years removed from Son of the Jedi. I did want more Star Wars. This was not it. And also for me, this is coming up on 10, right? So um, mm-hmm. that 9, 10 range, you do start to change a little bit. Star Wars has always been in my life, uh, always will be, but there was that little weird period of time. And it's it's weird to think here. This is September 7th, 1985. Well, a few months prior, back in March, Robotech was released. And as I've said before in the show, that means a lot to me, means the world to me. And it was, at least at the time, felt a lot more adult than Ewoks and Droids. Mm. Um, 
people died. You says, uh, you says saying people are going to die. They did in Robotech and <laughs> it seemed, seemed more heavier, seemed bigger. And it felt like a natural progression for me. And not that, not that I had these deep thoughts at, at 10. Well, this is a natural progression for me. It just, the two worlds plus, you know, other interests are starting to come to my life. And then it's like, cool. I do love star Wars. I love the Jedi. There's, what is going on here? Ewoks are dancing or whatever. I don't know. And I just, I didn't connect with them and I still haven't connected with them. They're on Disney plus I poked through them. I'm going to sit down. Um, I don't, uh, you know, uh, you all out there listening, uh, if, if, if you drink or don't drink or you do any kind of substances or whatever, it seems like that kind of show that <laughs> you might just want to sit down, <laughs> pour whiskey or take something else, uh, take some sort of gummy and go, whoa. Uh, so maybe one day I'll do that with a, a bottle of rum and take it all in because I think you're right, Joseph. There's a lot there. You look back and go, not unlike some of the original drafts of Lucas and stuff where we always talk about Mace Windy or the Naboo was a planet early on. Uh, there's so much stuff in there that people I think uh, have uh, built, uh, you know, in, into other wonderful things in Star Wars canon. Anyways, that's where my that's where I was in my life. So I have a weird uh, relationship with it where I just even now look at them and go, man, uh, that was a weird time for me as a Star Wars fan. But Jen, was it weird for you? Did you enjoy it? Where are you now with it? Well, I remember watching the Ewoks cartoon. Uh, but here's the problem. And I, and I was really excited about it. But I will say it did, it did kind of creep me out. And it was <laughs> a little dark. I remember that. And so here's, the, that was on ABC. But the block on NBC, you had Smurfs. Mm. Muppet Babies, Gummy mm. Bears, which premiered in September um, of that year as well. That had a hold on me. And it's like, do I want to watch the Smurfs, Muppet Babies, and Gummy Bears? Or do I want to watch the Ewoks, which can be a little scary, and this weird droids show? Mm -hmm. I chose the Smurfs and the Muppet <laughs> Babies and Gummy yeah. Bears. Oh, my gosh. Like that. <laughs> because it was just like light and happy and it didn't. Give me creepy nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I really wanted to love the Ewoks. I really did. Um, but yeah, it was very 80s. And now I've watched it uh, with my kids and they really enjoy it. But mm. there are some episodes that number one, feel kind of dated, you know, mm. uh, and number two, do get really scary especially mm. for my for my now three-year-old mama i don't like that <laughs> i don't like that weird character so uh, we don't watch it as much but my my uh seven-year-old she she still loves it and that actually was a huge win and a way for her to get into star wars when mm. she was too young to watch um the movies although <laughs> mm. there are some episodes that are definitely very dark yeah. This, this yeah. is such a perfect legacy for the Ewoks. We're like, oh, that Ewoks cartoon, is it too cute or too terrifying? The yeah. perfect Zen, Venn diagram of uh, Ewoks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So true. Oh Monster hypnotizing and then eating the animals. It can get a little, a little spooky. Yeah. 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 I also want to point out, too, as much as I'm saying at 10, I thought I needed to be adult and not watch these shows. I also was a huge Muppet Babies fan, so I just I went that direction, too. So that's all there. But, but you know why? Because why? Because what? Muppet Babies and their Star Wars and Indiana Jones parodies. I was waiting for those every week. So that's right. It's all connected. Well, there you go. You all can decide for yourselves if you haven't watched the shows. They're on Disney Plus. Uh, but that is what happened on September 7th, 1985. What a day in Star Wars history. We're almost out of here. Uh, we're going to let you know where you can find us. Thank you all for listening. We're the Force Center Podcast feed. We're on Twitter at Force Center Pod, Instagram, and YouTube as well. If you want to do us a favor, give us a sub over there on uh, YouTube. We do uh, monthly live Q&As. Uh, more additional programming is going to come uh, when all three of us, you know, have hours available. We're finally mm -hmm. going to put more regular things up there. Just bear with us over there. Facebook page is for center podcast. Uh, we're on Vero too, by the way, which I'm now using regularly. <laughs> we're still, we're on Vero. I think there's a post. I think it's an old uh, logo, but it, we're there. We're there. Uh, podcast available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and more. Just search and find us. Uh, merch available at tpublic.com slash Four Center uh, slash user slash Four Center and Patreon.com slash Four Centers, where you can support us directly. And from there, get into our Discord server. Uh, we keep it connected to the Patreon page just so we can make sure uh, all of our Four Center friends uh, can come to a nice, wonderful, warm place to discuss Star Wars. All sides of it have some a nice discourse. If you want to get there, you can get there uh, through our Patreon page, any level. You can follow me at Ken Napsock. Go to KenNapsock.com for more information on other things I, I'm doing. I am reviewing uh, House of the Dragon and Rings of Power on Castle Talk. Folks like 
Alden Diaz, Andres Cabrera, Rachel Cushing Levine, and more, uh, including uh, Lauren Roma from the Galactic uh, Podcast have been on there as well. So uh, check us out over there at Casterly Talk. Uh, Jennifer, where can they find you? I got to listen to it. I got to listen to it. Just watch the latest episode. Um, okay. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Jennifer Landa. My TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. The quiet before the and or storm. The quiet before my, and that's not so quiet, before my daughter goes back to school. Once she goes back mm. to school, I'll be having more content everywhere. So <laughs> I look forward to that <laughs> yeah. in a couple of weeks. That's awesome. We, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll do this on our agenda. I'm going to uh, nail you down here a little bit when, when when both your kids are in school and that might mean college maybe we have to wait to college <laughs> i'm gonna get you on a data bank dive uh, and, yes. and dive into something there soon so yes. uh joseph i know you got a lot of things uh, going on too where can they find you and get more in, uh, information on your stuff yeah i gotta first clear my schedule uh, for when jennifer's kid goes back to school so i can have more time to watch all the great jennifer landa content because the tiktoks are so good they really are they're Thank always you. funny and insightful and uh, they're so good Thanks. uh and in, in the work that you put into them absolutely shows. So no. anyway, yes, uh, you can find me uh, uh, watching videos or you can find uh, maybe some of my own videos on Twitter. Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw. All my other comedy stuff is on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. Uh, and uh, I got to put up there on the website. I will be in Portland for the HB Lovecraft Film Festival. I have a short film playing there and I believe I will be part of a QA and a uh, about some of the short films. Uh, more info on that coming soon. Uh, and as always, I want to give a shout out to Vote Forward, the organization where you can write letters to other voters to help them convince them to use their power and vote. If you're interested in doing that, uh, the website is votefwd.org. Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for uh, reminding us to do that more, too. Yeah, check that out. Uh, yeah, there you go. Have fun in Portland, as the replacements once sang. <laughs> we'll see you all next time here on Force Center. Oh, 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 o